Hello CS25. In this video I'm going to talk about best practices for documentation, um, looking at some of the areas on technical support, the skills that you have, and how to be able to document and manage inventory and do change management in our, for our systems. So in chapter 9 it talks about best practices and as the, a technician, you need to make sure that you are a good communicator um, because, you know, your IT career will be built on working with the customer, the user, and also the organization. So some of the things that you need to use in your documentation to uh, provide updates and things like that to the supervisor might be a network topology. A physical topology is a diagram that really map out the network um, on the level of the systems and how they are connected. The logical topology is a way to depict network design on how the group the systems are grouped on the local area network. It would have wiring closets, general areas of the building instead of the computers and this diagram will focus on network ip addresses so it's different than your physical topology in that the physical topology would have access point wiring closet the type of systems the, what would be connecting where the logical topology would include the network ip addresses and how they are the systems are grouped together in the domain like the following picture. So the tools that you can use for a network diagram would be something like Microsoft Visio. Would be it is proprietary and you have to pay a little bit of money for this. Or you can use Smart Draw, Lucid Chart, some of the available online uh, type of technology where you would be able to use it for free if you just sign up, and it is cloud based. So in your documentation, sometimes you would refer to a white paper, which is different than other type of articles in, in technical field, in that it would focus on the technical topic and it would be easy for an average user or reader to be able to understand. And companies sometimes write white papers on new technology, product information to really present to the product to the public in order to influence it. So some of the white paper repository I include the links here. And when you access knowledge bases, you'll be able to access forums and different type of resources for IT professional. Um, and the easiest way to really access the knowledge base, the, the, the articles and white paper is through knowledge base. So for example, if you want to learn about AWS, um, you would then go to the repository of their knowledge base that's offered by Amazon Web Services and be able to identify the resources like the white paper and the articles that you need. So let's answer some of the questions here. And the first question is says, what should be included in the physical network topology? It would include computers, systems, mobile devices, wireless routers, switches, routers, security appliances, network port maps, wiring closet, and cabling. Those are the things that need to go on the physical network topology, which is a layout of the network. And you can use the tool to be able to draw that, like Microsoft Physio or Draw.io and so on. Number two, what should you include in the logical topology of the network? That will be computers, network appliances, security appliances, IP addresses, and subnet information. And number three, what is a white paper? It is a document that contains technical details about system or product. 
It is published by the organization to market and promote products or systems. So for example, Verizon would have a repository or a knowledge base of the technology that they offer, like 5G. So you would be able to find the white paper on 5G and the relevant technology to that. Number four, what does knowledge base contain? It is consists of links that is commonly accessed in support forums where IT professional would seek and give technical support. And you would see this with Microsoft, IBM, and many of other companies out there, they would have knowledge base. Number five, why should a technician document an incident or a problem? So when you come across an incident and an incident could be uh, an infection of a malware on the, on the network. So we need to document it to really learn from the problem and the solution, whether our solution is effective or not. And we can improve when in the case that the incident occurs again. An incident could be that there is a breach on the network or an incident would be that someone stole a computer or a laptop or there's a loss or damage of a certain system. So we want to be able to document that so we can learn from the problem and how we derive the solution. So coming back to the notes now, we can talk about incident documentation. So here we would say that an incident can be any kind of issues that we might face that would impact the daily operation, hardware drive failures, system damage, loss. So we can then use a certain type of help desk software to be able to track the workflow in our customer service in the case where if our customer face an incident or our network face an incident. To comply with regulations and different compliance body, we're required to have policies and procedures in place. Policies such as acceptable use policy, which state what the user is allowed to do on systems and networks. Password policy on how passwords should be created and changed and issued to the system. And we did a lab last week or the week before that we would create password policy. Now, most of our duties would be maintaining, repairing our, our systems. And so with that, we would need to manage inventory from device to components of device. So we would use asset tags which are RFID tag to be able to track the type of systems that we have and what type of components that we need to repair on that system. So the IT department is responsible for documenting the equipment that it has, whether it's sold, donated, destroyed, and so on. And on the tags, we would have barcode and serial number. And we would we'll be required to do inventory management yearly, at least one time to two times a year. For change management, this is a process for changes in the network or for planning, staffing, organizing, and getting feedback from stakeholders. 
in compliance based on different regulations that we need to fulfill based on the type of business that we operate we need to have change management and what kind of change can occur well when you upgrade your system that's a change so we have to implement change management so in the change management you have to have a purpose of your change so if we're upgrading our entire network right we have to clarify the purpose of our upgrade to the network we would have a scope which is an extent for the impact of change how is that going to affect the outages the operations in our business so we would itemize things like applications equipment and what will be the outcome of those retired systems we would analyze the risk of the changes so how that will be in different level high medium or low if i take down the entire network and replace all the equipment the risk of business disruption is going to be high so we want to be able to lower the risk by strategizing on how we would be able to upgrade all our systems we might want to consider upgrading some of the systems that are not fully being used for daily operation first and we for our operation production system we want to test those thoroughly before we upgrade so with that we have to come up with step five which is our plan for change and this will be based on your analysis that was done in the last step and the impact of the change then in step six after you um, you have your plan in place you would want to be able to implement the change and get the user to accept it so in, we might have to work with the the employees to be able to get them trained to learn new applications or OS or new system usage. We might need to also include change board in that will be a group of people to be able to organize and uh, look at the impact of our change and derive the solutions to be able to resolve some of the issues with our changes. We also have an alternate plan that will be our backup plan to restore the network like it was before in the case that things don't work out. And we want to document the change. This would allow us to look at how we would implement it in the future and we would be able to further improve the change down the line. In documentation, we also want to have a disaster prevention and recovery. We want to have backup where we will back up system image, files, configurations, applications. These are important because user needs file and user needs application and system that is configured properly in order to work on a daily basis so after you back up you have to also test your backup and testing backup would be whether to see if the file is corrupted and how we'll be going to be able to access that file in case that we need to recover we also need to catalog the backup based on the time that we back up, what type of data and system that we're backing up. We also need to have UPS and search protectors. These are the backup 
power supply and UPS is intended to be used for a short time, like 30 minutes to two hours. So we would use that on our critical servers, our critical systems. Search protector should be used to connect all your network appliances and your systems to prevent brownout or in the case of spike power, it would not search your system. And would, that would cause disruption and loss of data. We can consider using cloud storage and local backups because even with cloud storage, what if something happened to the cloud company or what if something happens to your local backup where it's lost or damaged? So we should have alternate solutions in how we would have backups for our data. The types of backup, we would have the full, incremental, and differential. Your full backup would be the first primary to start. So if I have a company, let's say I do a full backup on Monday, I can subsequently do incremental and differential backup on the following days. But you always want to start with the full backup, which it backs up all your file, your application, your your configuration and so on. Incremental is a way that we would only back up the data has been changed since the last full backup or incremental backup. So what we can do is we can do all the incremental backup from Tuesday through Sunday again for that week. Now, incremental only backup the data has been changed since the last backup. And it is also be called cumulative incremental backup. So in order to restore, we have to first restore the full backup from Monday. Then we have to do the backup of the incremental on the last incremental backup. On differential is would be the it would also back up the change data since the last full backup. Now the difference between incremental and differential in that incremental um, does not set the attributes for the backup archive compared to differential. And differential backups are quicker than the full backup, but it contains less data as only it only contains the changes. So when you do recovery, you still have to do a full backup and then follow up with the differential. For the recovery, you would then do account recovery by using email address. Now in that, the tech support agent would then reset the account, would give the user the, the temporary password. And you can do this locally by going into computer management can't console, go to the user. If you are an administrator, you can right click the user account and choose reset password. On the network level, we would then do this in Active Directory, which is what you've seen in creating user accounts before. Common safety practices, we want to make sure that we use safety precaution when we're working with electronics equipment. Make sure that we're properly grounded using your um, wristbands and also touch metal equipment before you touch other area of, of or the components hardware. We also want to make sure that we would be careful with voltage and searches of our line because that could be in that could cause injury, fire, and damage. So here it shows you the electrical circuit. The left is going to be your neutral. The right is hot. Hot is going to be where the voltage is coming from, and then ground. So when the ground outlet is not available. 
Um, then we we want to make sure that a ground or a grounded adapter is then being temporary use. Okay. And you can use a connector or a ground loop like this. And in the United States, our grounded is 120 volts for the AC. You can also use a tester as shown in the picture here to test the ground. When you handle components in storage, as I said earlier, we want to make sure that we use anti-static wrist strap, anti-static mats. We want it to ground ourselves. We want to avoid damaging our, our devices via electrostatic discharge, your ESD. So equipment can be damaged by ESD with 700 volts or higher, and the table gives you a little bit more on different types of equipment. So self-grounding is very important, especially when you're doing repair. Okay, don't touch the chips. Don't touch the circuits with your bare hands. Um, when you handle components in car, hold it by the edge of the bracket. Handle components and stay, stay stationary. Do not shuffle your feet to cause static. And also make sure that we wear anti-static type of protection. And then we would avoid AC power tools near the computer. And we'll use battery powered devices only when this is necessary. When we handle toxic, such, toxic components such as battery, toner, CRT display, cell phone, and tablets, we want to make sure that we refer to the safety list on how to handle some of the chemical based type of device like battery. And so we need to properly recycle them for the e-recycle, where if battery is disposed, right, it would then um, cause environmental damage. So we want to make sure that we recycle them properly. We want to also check regulations on how we would be able to ship or transfer these type of batteries because they do cause fire and explosion. Toner models and cartridges also need to be disposed properly. So you can bring that to office supply stores or places where you would be able to um, give them and they would have the proper uh, business or provider to be able to, to, to handle the recycling. So after we remove the toner cartridge, use a special use vacuum cleaner to be able to remove, remove the loose powder from the cartridge. And so that way it doesn't get everywhere on the system. Your CRT, do not ever actually open up the CRT monitor. Those are the big bulky monitor because it can cause um, injury by touching the, the, live, the live tubes inside. And when we recycle these, we want to make sure that we properly, we bring it to the proper recycling center. Same thing with LCD and smartphone. So we want to remove the SIM card from the smartphone and for the LCD or CCLF display, we want to make sure that we properly uh, bring it to the electronic recycler. Now, on the smartphone and tablets, we need to remove the SIM card and anything that stores data to make sure that sensitive data doesn't get leaked. When we work with computers, we want to make sure we remove jewelry of any kind because that can cause damage to the components or can cause injury. We can we should always disconnect the power when we're repairing PC. When you're lifting equipment, especially large equipment, make sure that you get assistance and lift with by bending your knees instead of 
using your back. Okay. So the weight limitation, if the equipment is too heavy, at least a quarter of your body weight, then you should ask someone to help. With fire and electrical safety, live wire is going to cause fire if it's short. Do not attempt with your bare hands and to make sure that your feet are dry. You're not standing on water. We use a wooden stick or a board or a rope to be able to uh, move away, but usually you want to stay away from this. When you when you find someone who's unconscious underneath the live wire, do not touch the person. For cable management, any external USB cable should be routed. And so that way they don't interfere with other areas or work area of the employee. Network cable should always be routed in from the walking area so that people don't trip over it. So we want to use something like a conduit to be able to, and then if you need to run the network cable, usually it's running through the wall or the ceiling. When you solder, do cleaning repair that can cause dust, dirt, or fly away of screws, you want to wear goggles or safety glasses to protect your eyes. And in the case where you're working with debris, you also need to wear fil air mask filter. Now we would see that we also regularly wear masks. So we want to make sure that we use masks, especially when we work with, with hazardous material and also debris. To be compliant, we need to make sure that we follow the material safety data sheet. This would give you different ratings and how to handle some of your uh, toxic or different type of materials. So coming back to our question now, we would say that number six, why should an organization implement acceptable use policy to protect its computing resources, assets, and establish rules on how the system should be used in the network. For number seven, what is the purpose of asset tax in inventory management? This allows the company to track who is responsible for equipment and how often it needs to be repaired. And it can, it can be used to track the system while it is used in the company. For question eight, sell your homes are, is a real estate company that plans to replace 10 inkjet color printers with five high speed monochrome laser to reduce cost and wait time. Identify the necessary processes that are needed to manage this change. First, that will be business process practice to inform the staff of the printer change plan that provide timeline and available printers during the change period. So as we're retiring some of the old printer, we want to make sure that we let them know what printers are available for them to use. Two, scope. We would remove the recycled 10 existing inkjet printer and we will install five laser monochrome printer and that would save some money there. So we would then need to install drivers on the print server and update ink supply inventory. So that's gonna be our scope. For risk assessment, this for the low risk, the new printer would be malfunctioning and the user is unable to print in color. For the medium risk, not enough printer during the replacement period. And the high risk would be the print driver is not compatible with our existing OS, which defeats the whole purpose of our printer. Plan would be the impacted print jobs that are used for sales. So 
uh, in the case that they can't print, we would then divert it to digital marketing in that we would test the drivers for compatibility. We would train the user on how to use the new printer. And for the change board, the change board would approve requests for change, printer models, and implementation timeline. For our backout plan, we would use inkjet printer for marketing and laser printer for high capacity printing. To lastly document the change, we would record the plan, risk, inventory, and lesson learned. For number nine, identify three levels of data backup. We would need to backup system image, file level backup, and critical application backup. For number 10, why should we, why should backups be tested? to ensure that data is available when the backup is needed. For number 11, a client asks you to help identify UPS for his home, so small home business, search the internet to locate a UPS that costs less than $500, provide UPS brand, model price, and output wattages. So here, um, I had selected this UPS and as you can see it is less than $500 but if you evaluate the specification for this you would see that when we use it at a certain wattage it's only able to provide for a certain amount of minutes. So if we are running this UPS at 50 watts, it would, we would be able to use it at 146 minutes. But if we have it at 100 watts, that will only be 90 minutes. So the more system that we're connecting to this, the less that it's going to last because itself is a battery. So the output for this is a total of 900 watts and the input is 120 volts, okay? So we wanna make sure that we calculate the critical system wattage when we shop for a UPS and generator to be able to make sure that it's gonna accommodate the amount of wattage that we need for the time. So if, if I need 800 watts, it's only gonna last me less than 10 minutes using this UPS. So you can simply for this question search online for a UPS which is uninterrupted power supply. It's a form of battery to be able to connect to the critical system in the case of the power outage. And then you can provide the details for that UPS for number 11. Then it asks you to review and compare the features of two search protector that's listed below and select the option that you would purchase for home use. Explain why you would select those options. So we have APC and GE. And they cost roughly about the same price, close maybe a few dollars difference. But the things that you want to pay attention to is going to be the jewel rating here compared to this. So the APC has higher jewel rating. It is able to connect more outlets. So there are more devices that can be connecting to it. The length is about the same and there is some warranty that's lifetime. So I would go with the option A in that because it has higher jewel rating and we are able to connect more devices and it is lifetime warranty. So in your notes, it provided 
some information about protecting your system physically with temperature, humidity, and air. So we want to make sure that our, our temperature is about 68 to 76 Fahrenheit degrees for our server systems. With humidity would be between 20% to 60%. For ventilation, we want to make sure that we would be able to have air treatment and filtration. The following section talks about surge protector brownouts and blackouts. So power surges are common in that we our AC power would not be a constant. It changes sometimes it surge high and low. So we want to make sure that we use surge protector. So surge suppressors are rated in joules, which indicates the amount of energy of surge. So the higher the joules, the better it is in that it's able to handle higher surges. Now, you would know that the units is, it uses metal oxide baristers or MOVs, which is better in protection than if you're using a single large MOV. So if you have the MOVs that absorbs the the searches eventually it will wear out so this is why you have to replace your search protector after a few years like five years so in order to really identify the right search protector we would combine the wattage or the volt amp readings of the device and we would calculate and compare that to the maximum of the search protector that can handle okay and search protector should be replaced between three to five years in that the movs would be deteriorating and also in the case where we have lightning strike frequent power flickers burn marks smokes and so on that cause damage to the search protector, so we would then need to replace that. Brownouts and blackouts. So brownouts is the voltage drop in that it would affect a large area uh, that would be close to your home or your business. Blackouts would be that it is a total loss of power where brownouts, there's the same voltage drop into half of the output. So in organization, the prohibited content or activity, the company would then be required that content stored on the, the computer, their computer is then company owned. And if it's stored on mobile devices and network, right, that would be pertaining to organizational policy. Any perform that's so any activity that's performed on company's computer would then be considered um, to be owned by the organization, mobile or network device that will be contrary to the organizational policy. When someone is acted in inappropriately, then would have certain type of responses to the place where it would protect the organization and the user. In the incident's response, the first response would be the first person that would be there to identify exactly what happened. It would be essentially reported to the proper channel so that way procedures can be carried out to ensure that data and device preservation is in place. We would also need to document uh, what happened and we would go through chain of custody. And this is where evidence is gathered and documented and tracked. Software licensing is essential in the technical area for support. You have digital rights management or your DRM, which is where software and services mechanism is limited to user rights to copy, transfer, 
and new software. So when you're upgrading system, your RDM based apps, it's important to really determine the advance of how to the upgrade will affect your software licenses. As if we update, upgrade our system, we have to upgrade our operating system and potentially software as well. In software licensing, you also see end user license agreement that would restrict on how the app is being used and what would be the transfer rights. So make sure that we check that, especially for a certain app or OS for legal purposes. Open source versus commercial license in that the open source would be freely distributed. The source code is freely distributed. That can be freely accessed, used, changed, and shared in modified and unmodified form by anyone. Now, open source license required that the seller of the open source license not limit the rights to the purchaser of use, change, and share software. For commercial license, the opposite. It does not cover the source code distribution and limit how the license can be used. So for Microsoft, we're required to buy a license per user or Adobe Creative Cloud, we would buy, we would subscribe based on the user that would be used. Personal license versus enterprise license. Enterprise license can differ in that, that the software would cover with the management and security features. It would also have different rules on how to upgrade. And also, uh, you would see that some personal software license would be more restrictive compared to for business use. So if you buy like student license, you cannot use that for business. In regulating the data, we have personal identifiable information that would be name, address, driver license, credit card number, security number. PCI would be your payment card industry standards that would allow the that would require that the business protect credit card holder data and information about the credit. GDPR is your general data protection regulation. This is for European countries and organization to protect health information, biometrics, genetic, and criminal history. PHI is personal health information. This is for HIPAA requirement to cover health status, payments, account numbers, and beneficiaries. So we want to make sure that we configure cloud storage and local system to protect sensitive information, possibly using encryption. Also using network appliances, we also need to make sure that encrypted transmission is used. When you use point of sale systems, especially wireless point of sale system, make sure that strong encryption is used. Sometimes we would encrypt the entire disk using BitLocker, BitLocker to go. We would configure hardware and software firewalls to, to filter the data and protect the data. And we would educate the user on how to remove personal identifiable information from document photos and other files. So when we communicate with professional, we want to use proper language. We want to maintain positive attitude. Even when customer is angry, we want to make sure that we project confidence and show patience and listen actively to the customer. We want to be culturally sensitive, be punctual. It's very important that we are on time. And we want to, in the case that if we are late, we need to notify the business. We would need to make sure that we avoid distractions 
don't use our smartphone frequently when we communicate with people so because it costs disruption when you deal with customer it's customer no matter how tough the problem gets do not argue with the customer we want to minimize customers problem we don't want to minimize customer problems we want to listen to the customer and so that way we can get as much information as we can to help them resolve the problem. No matter how correct their actions or how poor the judgment would be, we would do not we do not judge the customer. So we want to focus on the problem and find a conclusion. We want to clarify customer statement with open ended questions and narrow the scope of the problem we don't want to disclose experiences on social media or share that with other entity that can cause harm or reputational harm so we want to set and meet expectation by making sure that we're meeting timeline and we want to regularly follow up with the customer by updating status. How do you plan to fix it? How long will it take? How much more extra will it cost? We want to minimize any kind of surprises. To deal with confidential and private materials, we want to make sure that we are mindful of customer data and how to make sure that we remove the private materials along that would that could be broken or damaged so in the case that you need to remove the confidential materials such as bank statement account information you need to notify the customer if you're using script files or text files make sure that we are we follow performance or or we look at the system requirement os compatibility and making sure that it's not going to cause any additional damage to the system or impact the system in any way so script could be used to automate and streamline some of the tasks that we can do such as installing drivers doing things on the network and so in that some programming knowledge as you can see here is recommended so it talks about environmental variables that would allow the script to run and so making sure that that will have the sources in the appropriate places you can set that in windows system in your system advanced system properties Now, your remote access technology as a support technician, you will be using different type of remote technology, such as we would use like TeamViewer, or sometimes we would be able to connect. Nowadays, we can use Zoom quite a bit, but in Windows environment, you can use RDP, which allows you to remotely connect to the desktop. So RDP is proprietary to Microsoft. You can go to settings, system, remote desktop, and we want to also enable this through the firewall, otherwise it would not be connecting. Telnet can be used, but it imposes a lot of vulnerability. So a lot of the times we want to stay away from Telnet as it is a way to terminally connect using port 23. But we want to use SSH instead. So you can use SSH to connect to servers and system. And a, an application that you often see for this is to use PuTTY or terminal type of application. And we can connect it to the command line and be able to use the command line uh, interface to be able to access the system. So for file sharing, we can securely share files using secure file transfer protocol which uses SSH instead of using FTP.
And this is very important because a lot of times we share files, we would also be able to control share resources using cloud-based storage and manage the permission based on that. So to answer the last few questions for number 13, Best Deal Electronics is a small business that sells electronic parts and appliances. The store operates Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Identify the types of backup that will be suitable for this business. We would use a full backup on every Sunday and an incremental backup daily at 12 p.m., so in the middle of the day. So we would then only lose data for half of a day unless we have a, a loss of data at the end of the day which costs us to then yeah so if we would then only lose data half of the day if we set it up in the middle of the day but that would you know take up a lot of the resource when we're backing up while we're in operation so you can also do differential backup here after you do a full backup so that's really depend on whether you want to archive the bits as backup or not for 14 how can you determine if electrical outlet is properly grounded you can use an electrical outlet tester for 15 how do you employ anti-static measures when handling computer components we would use anti-static bags esd mats or or straps or we can do self-grounding by touching material uh, metal material. 16. What are the five types of computer related toxic waste? That would be batteries, toners, CRT displays, cell phones, and tablets. For 17, how do you dispose a CRT display? You would need to bring the display to the electronic recycling center for dismantling. For 18, Describe personal safety measures that you should take when working as a technician. We would disconnect the power before working on the system. We would remove jewelry before working on the system. We would take precaution when lifting heavy objects or known weight limitation. We would wear safety goggles and masks. For 19, you're asked to install 10 desktop computers, 10 monitors, three laser printers, 10 IP phones, and network switch, and a network switch on a small office. How many search protector would you use to connect the system in the device office? So we would need at least 10 search protector because if you're looking at between all of these combined, you have 10, 13, 23, and 24 appliances. I'm sorry, 34 appliances. So 34 appliances, if, if you have five connection per search protector, so you would need at least 10. And we would then, because we want to do system monitor on one and possibly some of them would have laser printer so that will be between 10 to 15 search protector just to be able to expand for number 20 explain the difference between open source and closed source software license your open source software would be freely accessed and used and changed and shared and modified by anyone it is made by the people and distributed under the license to comply open source definition. Commercial license does not cover source code and it is limited to how the license can be used. They must be purchased for use. For 21, list a common programming language that can be used for scripting. You can use Windows Batch File, PowerShell, VBScript, Linux shell script, Python, and JavaScript. For 22, identify the protocols and services used in remote access. 
we can use SSH, RDP, and Telnet. So this concludes my video for Unit 13 lecture, which covers Chapter 9 and it talks about best practices, software licenses, and power protection.